Hi, um, I quite often get asked about techniques for reverse engineering. Now it's one of those things that you can't really teach um, because every job's different, there's all sorts of different techniques. But I recently had the need to um, investigate some hardware so I thought I'd do a video just to cover some of the basic techniques that I used. I'm not going to do it like as I go along so that's just not practical but so I, I, I'll just sort of repeat basically the important parts of the process that I used. Uh, it's also a good opportunity to explain some of the more advanced features um, that are coming into uh, oscilloscopes. Previously only available on fairly high-end kit but it's a lot of the features like um, intensity displays, segmented memory, burst triggers which are starting to appear in much lower cost scopes like the um, for example the Regal, Regal 2000. So um, now what I was actually looking at was the feasibility of using the uh, screen for the 6th gen iPod Nano for a large um, installation using a lot of them. Um, so the question really was, you know, about how, how can we drive these? These are available sort of nice and cheap there, high res 240 by 240 and they're in a square format which is fairly unusual. Rule number one of reverse engineering is know your enemy. In other words, spend a fair amount of time trying to find out any information you can from any source. I just can't overemphasize how important this is because even literally a tiny snippet or one line into the data sheet can give you that magic piece of information you need or just point you in the right direction or give you a little clue or even just um, give you a clue as to what not to look, look for. Um, we had the data sheet for this but it was a really brief data sheet. It's got a block diagram showing the actual signals going in and out. Some specification, in fact this was probably one of the most important bits of, the inf bits of information on this data sheet. It's saying the, the interface is MIPI 1 lane 24 bits D5. Now I'd, I'd never come across this before well, we'll go, go into that in a minute. I'll just go through the, what, what else is on this um, data sheet that's useful. We've got max ratings which aren't, aren't especially um, of interest. Uh, we've got some natural characteristics that tells us our supply voltage, which, which is always, always a, a good start. And very useful, a pinout. Now, quite often when you're reverse engineering something, you don't have the luxury of a pinout. But in a lot of cases, it's not always that, that hard to figure out at least the vast majority of the signals. So, for example, you typically... You know, given just a connector that you don't know anything about on a on a board of a piece of equipment, the first thing you do is obviously find all the grounds, and you can literally just do that with a meter on continu continuity mode. You can always find a ground point somewhere um, on a shielding can or something, and then just literally go 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 across each pin, finding out which one has continuity to ground. Uh, power connections again, for example, if you've got a thick track going to a pin, chances are that's a power connection. If you've got a decoupling cap right next to it, again, chances are that's something to do with power. Obviously, you can go around with a scope or a meter to each pin and look at what voltage is on each pin but that won't necessarily tell you if a signal is a, logic, you know, a static logic signal or a power signal but generally you can quite often eliminate a lot of the, the things like power and ground which then leaves you with the, the, the data and control signals which are of interest but obviously ha having this just saved time you know, most of this could probably have been figured out without the data sheet but again you know having that the time spent finding data is usually well, well, well worth it because that will save you way more time in the actual reverse engineering and general figuring stuff out process. There's not much else. That usually these LCD data sheets are full of all sorts of optical characteristics that are just of no interest whatsoever. So that's really it. So it's a very brief data sheet. The only other bit of information that's handy here is this drawing that actually tells you how the pin numbers relate to the actual connect. The other useful thing here is it tells you the actual manufacturer part number of the connector. Now, one thing that's quite important, if you're reverse engineering something with a view to actually using it for something, particularly if you know you want to use it in production or for a project that you're going to need more than one of, is make sure you can actually get the connector. I mean, I, I had a look at a, a very early iPod display a few years ago. There's some information on my website about that. And although I sort of managed to figure out most of the details, that project pretty much grounds a halt because you just used a, a um, flat flex connector that had a really weird number of pins. And yeah, the only way you could get those was to order about 10,000 of them on a 16 week lead time. So, you know, don't spend a lot of time reverse engineering something that you can then find you can't actually use it because you can't get the damn connector. But fortunately, this is, um, yeah, they tell you the connector and it's from Molex, which means you can actually get them. You can get them from DigiKey in one offs quite, quite readily. Now, okay, it's good that you can get the connectors, but this one was sort of quite challenging, is that these connectors are a bit on the small side. They're 04 millimeter pitch. And in fact, this one is about the same size as a 1206 resistor. So they are very, very small. So even up, yeah, making up an adapter to um, break this out is a, a somewhat non-trivial exercise. Right, so this was pretty much the only information we get about the interface. Um, the key phrases be here being sort of MIPI, DeFi and DSI. Now so this is something I've never heard of 
before. But it turns out this is, MIP is an organisation to set standards for um, peripheral devices and interfaces for uh, typically mobile phone and similar um, devices. On a typical modern mo mobile phone you've got so many different interfaces for cameras, um, displays, RF stuff, GPS tracking, all sorts of other um, things that um, a group of companies that uh, make silicon for the for um, these devices decided it would make sense to actually try and standardise on the interfaces. And the one we're interested in is the display interface, DSI, Display Serial Interface. And there's quite a few different sort of standards um, relating to it. It gives an overview about what each bit does, what it's, what they're trying to achieve and so on. Um, so it goes from the sort of the overall command interface, colour representation and the low level hardware signalling and so on. However, here's the problem. You can only get these specs if you're a member of the organisation somewhat like the uh, SD card situation. And surprise surprise, to become a member you have to pay um, either $8,000 or if you can show that your turnover is less than $250 million a year you get it at the bargain price of $4,000. And of course once you sign this you've got to sign NDA so even if you've got the specs you, you're, they're limited as to how much information you can pass on. So um, this is our problem. We can't get the specification, we've only got a very brief data sheet so um, how do we find out more? Now there are a few snippets of information on the MIPI website, there's like a very general over overview of some of the specs. So there's a bit of information about the DeFi, which is the uh, physical layer, um, but not a great deal. And of course this applies to quite a wide variety of different displays, so we don't quite know what subset our display conforms to. But it just gives us a few little snippets of information. Now I did quite a lot of googling around with various sort of permutations of yeah, MIPI, DSi, DeFi, etc. And this was actually one of the most useful bits of information I found. This is actually from Agilent and it's a set of um, presentation slides on test solutions for this. Obviously Agilent sell expensive test setups for testing um, all this high frequency stuff. But there's actually some quite nice bits of overview information in, in these slides that gives us actually quite a lot of useful information. And then we get on to the actual DeFi information which gives us a bit of information there. And that actually starts going into quite a lot of detail about the physical signalling levels, which again is very useful, and some nice sample scope traces, and explaining what the various phases of the communication are. So, yeah, this is really, really useful information. And also, things like this, it actually starts giving you some general outline information on packet formats, which of course is extremely useful. If all you can see on your scope is a big load of bits, having at least some background information of the sort of structure of these things is extremely useful in trying to figure out what's actually going on. So th this was probably the one document that was the most useful. I did find some other things, there's not another, some other documents. Um, this is actually a user manual for some software for generating and simulating um, these signals and it, it does give you, a few, for example, you can set up all the signals for an LCD on here. Again, there's a few little snippets of information dotted around here so that's actually quite a, a, a few very handy little bits of information there which at least will help to actually understanding what we're seeing once we actually start looking at the um, the, uh, the signals on the real device. Right so this is our hardware and the, the real challenge on this is actually getting a connection to the thing while it's running. Um, there's these two connectors which are for the display and the touch screen respectively but the problem is that once these are plugged in you've got very little access to them you know, once those are in place you've got just a tiny tiny slot one side. You can just about get a probe in sort of to the four corner connections and that's that that's really sort of pretty much it. Now one thing I was considering doing was to make was making some sort of, sort of riser by taking these two connectors, make, getting some PCB made with some 0.4mm pitch tracks, and have the two pieces of PCB at right angles to the connector so I could actually get you know, get maybe a few millimetres of distance, plug it, plug into this socket and just lift this high enough up and have some PCB to connect to. But while I was waiting for these um, connectors to come in from DigiKey, I actually had a close look at the PCB. Probably not going to be visible on the camera, but there's, I, I noticed that there's a, there was a track going from one of the data lines, which went up and then across here and then along to this chip. And I noticed there was another one running in parallel with it by the time it got here, and then another two. So I just scraped the um, resist off the PCB, 
and just did some continuity checks and verified that these are actually the, the two differential clock and data lines. So by just scraping this resist off I did actually have access to the most important signals that I needed to look at. Now one word of warning when you're sort of doing this, with PCBs that have got a very fine pitch, the copper layers tend to be quite thin because of the etching process. You generally can't have a track which is thinner than the thickness of the copper because of the, you know, it, it, the, the etching process. So that where you've got a very fine tracking, the copper itself is probably going to be very fine copper, so you need to be quite careful that you don't scrape and actually take the copper off. Um, what I tend to use for sort of the initial attack is uh, a number 10 scalpel blade because you've got the curve on it and you can just get, get in there and um, give it a scrape. Assume you've got enough space to get the blade in on. If this was even sm even more cramped, I may have sort of ground a little bit off this blade just to get, get a really small blade length. And the other thing that can be quite handy is a, um, a fiberglass pencil, which is, so this is just a load of fiberglass strand, and so you, you, you can get sort of quite some quite good at abrasion in there just to get the um, get resist off and you need to get it back so you've got just solid clear copper there before you can before you get at it then of course you've got the challenge of actually soldering wires onto this now these tracks are too really too small to get solder wire on there so generally what i use uh, the technique i use is to just put some solder paste on there and then just touch the tracks with the finest tip soldering um finest soldering iron tip that i've got to try and sort of touch the tip onto the track uh, in the hope that that will then melt some solder because you, you need to have so some solder on these tracks before you start you'll never solder anything to it unless you know if you tin these so I mean this is the finest point and even that you can see that's actually wider than the tra track itself but eventually I, I managed to get some um, solder on this is a, a second unit I had two units to uh, sacrifice to do this so this is the, the relatively untouched one so here's the actual unit that I did um, this is some very fine enameled copper wire just getting these five wires on took about two hours. Um, uh, so the, the trick is once you've got the solder on the tracks is to then get um, the fine piece of wire, get plenty of solder on it, plenty of flux on there, and just get the wire held in the right position and just sort of touch it with the iron to, just to reflow it. And that will you know, that will typically take quite a few attempts. And obviously when you've got them very close together, you've got the risk of accidentally unsoldering the adjacent ones. Obviously here we also have the challenge is it has to sort of go, go horizontally to um, clear the plug when it's plugged in because we've got so little space around it and there's one other connection the sink pin that was really really difficult that was I just needed to attack a single pin right on the middle and uh, that I think that that took like about 40 minutes of effort just to get that that one on there without doing any other damage the other thing that's really important when you're doing this is to not skimp on making a nice sort of solid platform for, for working on I and mean, what you don't want is just you know, a load of wires hanging off this thing because they'll just fall off and snap off because they're, they're so incredibly fragile. So what I did, I actually sort of just got this little board, stuck the thing down with the sticky tape, made a little platform to hold the LCD in a nice position for the flex to curve around in there, made a nice thing for holding our probes. I've done a separate video on the probing. So basically what I've done is these wires, I, I stuck down this bit, this is the piece of prototyping board, that I again stuck down very firmly so that when I was attaching these wires, I had two very solid points I could, you know, from where I was going, I then had a very solid place to, to solder those down to. And that then gave me some nice pads that I can solder to, because obviously you don't know how long you're going to need this for, because it might be a, a very long effort. You, you don't necessarily know what you're going to need to connect to it. You might need to actually add a little board on the side for, to make some data capture hardware or something. But the other aspect is that once you do get it working on maybe on your own hardware, you're still going to want this for reference so that, for example, when your thing isn't working, you want to be able to compare the waveforms between what this thing's doing and what your thing's doing. So you know, it's really worth the time to actually make something that's nice and solid. You know, you might want to put it away and come back to it later so you you know you want something you can just put on the shelf without worrying about these these wires coming off and it, this is something I did a good few years ago um, this was obviously a bit much um, much less tiny but a similar principle I, I broke out surface mount EEPROM to an external zip socket so I could put a memory emulator on it and there's an E-square prompt that's also tacked down but again this is all you know fixed together really solidly so by just picking this up and moving it it's not going to um, fall apart and stop working because there's nothing worse than spending ages you know, getting 95% through a reverse engineering thing and then your test rig breaks or just yeah, dies or you kill something um, that's extremely frustrating so it's well worth the time to make a nice sort of good solid debug platform uh, the other thing you need to think quite carefully about when you're figuring out how to fix this down is to make sure that you don't block off access to anything you need so you've got access to the ports access to the buttons you've got the screen nice and visible so you can use the screen you can operate the touch screen 
without having to like go, go to weird angles. So you, you just think about where you're going to take your cables out, how you're going to stick it down so that you're not, you know, you don't stick the whole thing together. Then suddenly find you can't turn it on or you can't get to a button or something. But so you've got this thing working quite happily in its sort of semi disemboweled state. So we can now start probing and um, seeing what's actually going on with it. Right, I've got this set up with the display next to the scope so we can see both at once, um, just for convenience for the video. Obviously it's a, not a very convenient way of actually working. So obviously we can actually see, one. the first thing we notice, we only see display data when the display is changing. So that tells us that there's going to be memory on here that holds the display when it's not being updated. Now obviously on a portable device one reason for doing that is power. Um, every time it's sending data to this, dis to this display it's, it's using power. Um, so obviously that, that's a bit of a pain when you try and analyse what's going on. But one thing I found is that the clock display does actually update fairly continuously, so um, that, that, that's a help. So at least we've, you know, it's worth playing around with different modes just to get an idea of which things cause which behaviour, just to figure out which ones are the easiest to use. The other big advantage of something like this is that it lets you load photos into it. Now of course what that means is that we can actually generate test patterns so for example, we can generate screens of full white, full black, individual lines, grey shades, whatever. That grey shade is a particularly useful one, which we'll get onto in a minute. But basically it means that we can force this thing to display pretty much whatever we want. So that's going to be very useful in figuring out the actual format of the display day. We're looking at the two data lines, one of the differential clock lines and also the sync line. This is the sync one uh, up here, if we just trigger on that, um, that will give us a little bit of stability. Now, because we had that data sheet, we actually know that this sync signal is an output from the display to the um, the host. One problem is when you're trying to use a touch screen and look at the scope at the same time, you do tend to get out of step sometimes. We know that's a signal from the display to the scope, but quite often if you're deb debugging an interface, you don't necessarily know which direction the interface is going in. So how do you tell? Well, for that you really need some sort of debug setup where you can actually break the connection between that signal and the and let, let's say it's a display. It's also applicable for example if you've got two devices just communicating uh, over a bi-directional bus, so maybe I squared C or something, you sometimes need to know which direction that data is going in. Um, and there's actually quite a simple method of figuring that out. So if you have your two devices and one of them has a driver driving a signal into the other one but you don't know which, which so you don't know whether it's the post talking to the display or the um, display talking to the host what you do is you just add some resistance into that line typically say a few hundred ohms will, will be a normal value what you can then do is you actually probe one line but you add some a higher resistance let's say on 10k would be a good so let's say for example that's on a 220 ohms and this might be perhaps say 10k what you've now done is you've formed a potential divider. So if you probe it there, if you look at the, 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 those two signals, because you've got this potential divider now, and these values aren't low enough, aren't going to attenuate the signal enough that this thing's going to stop working, but you're going to see a higher amplitude of signal at that point than you're going to see here because of this divider. So if, yeah, if you probe it this way and you see that, then you know it's this side sending. Similarly, if it's the other way around, if you, if you sort of did this one first, because this output driver is generally going to be a fairly strong signal. Um, if that's the first one you tried, then you probably wouldn't see any difference between the side, and that will tell you that that's the drive side. Um, but if you've got a situation where you've actually got two signals driving, say, a tri-state bus, you can use a, a similar um, technique if you've just got literally a setup like that. Um, whichever one is driving will give you the, the highest signal. If, if you actually put a resistor on both sides, it can actually make it a bit easier sometimes. So. If you set up like that with two resistors and a series resistor, then whichever one is giving you the higher signal is, is going to be the one that's driving it at that particular instant. So that, that's quite a handy technique for figuring out which way data is going. But obviously it does mean you need to break into the signal. So if we, were, if we had to do this on this thing, we'd actually need to make that riser board. We'd have to cut a track on it, which would get quite fiddly. But this is fairly at the extreme levels of fiddliness and a lot of things are a lot easier to get it get into and start chopping tracks and inserting resistors. Right, so we can see our basic signals here. This is our frame sync signal. There's this jitter, I'm not quite sure what's going on with that. But one issue is when we zoom in, this sync signal isn't really locked very well to the actual data signal. So we've got quite a lot of jitter. So in terms of actually wanting to get, yeah, start looking at it in detail, that, that sync signal isn't really going to be a very good thing to trigger off of. 
Uh, the other thing about, about you know, video signals in general, you've got quite a wide range of time scales. You've got like about a 16 milliseconds or so frame time, and then you sort of zoom right in to the actual clock, and it's actually about a 100 megahertz clock we've got here. So this is where having a scope with deep memory is really useful. I mean, if we just take a single snapshot of that, we can actually get pretty much, this has got 8 mega sample um, storage, the scope. Um, it's just timing out, but if we sort of start from there, we can actually zoom in quite a long way and still get fairly good resolution. But if we, um, yeah, you always run into some little memory. So if we take, if we grab that amount of data and then zoom in, we start finding that we, we just run up, we've just got no resolution, it's just completely disappearing. Right, and th this sort of situation, um, it's very important to think about triggering and scopes with more advanced trigger facilities can actually make life a whole lot easier. See, one issue you've got here, say we've got this jitter relative, you know, the easiest thing we're, sync we're triggering off is this, this frame sync, but that's actually not very good because it's not very stable relative to the waveforms we're looking at. So, um, let's actually try triggering on this waveform data, we'll trigger on uh, this trace here, which is the uh, green. Now the first problem is that we've just lost our frame sync, because obviously we've got lots and lots of edges and we're triggering on pretty much any old edge. So the way you get around this is to use hold off. What hold off does is when it's triggered, it then adds a time delay before it's allowed to trigger again. So where we have a, a complex signal that has some built-in uh, period, if we set a hold off time to be similar to that period, so make sure we're not in auto trigger mode as well of course that makes uh, quite a difference so this this is with zero hold off we now um, increase the hold off to be similar to our frame time which we know is about 16 milliseconds we can now get a, get a situation so you, this is one of these things where you, you really have to adjust it by eye so for example if the hold off is slightly too long what's happening is we're triggering on here we're holding off to here and then we're triggering somewhere in here but if the hold off period is from here to about here we get a completely solid waveform because we're triggering on that point and then we're completely ignoring any events until this window so we've actually now got a nice solid stable um, waveform and because although we've got jitter between the frame sync and the these signals these signals signals seem to be on a fairly solid clock so we can actually now go in and we've got a fairly good um, stable waveform and the nice thing about hold off because it's a hold off from an absolute time from the trigger start to that point we can actually change our time based settings without losing our synchronization we're still synced on that um, on that point so that's that's our, our initial trigger event now we do have a little bit of jitter uh, internal timing jitter from this thing but it's certainly a lot more stable than it was so that that's our first sort of improvement on trigger now there's another issue. We can obviously we can, we've got this nice stable signal. We can zoom in and look at look at it where, wherever we like, um, in principle. Um, so if we're looking here, for example, we've got this nice sort of solid trigger. We can see our hundred megahertz clock. We've got a little bit of jitter on it, but not not too much. That, that's quite usable. But the problem is, if we then want to zoom in, say here, we've still got a little bit of jitter. You know, this first thing we're triggering on, there's a little bit of jitter between that and the start of the actual frame. But even if we didn't have that, there's a secondary issue in that it, yeah, the time between there and there is say 16 milliseconds, but if we want to go right down to the clock level, we're talking you know, um, just a few nanoseconds. And however stable your signal is, there's always, always going to be a certain amount of jitter. So if you're sort of starting off here and then zooming in all the way down here, um, you'd still get... I'll see if I can actually get this a bit more stable. Um, Right, the photo mode seems to be a bit more stable than the, uh, the clock mode. So we've got this fairly stable trigger. These these pulses here seem to sort of wiggle around a little bit, um, but we we've, we've still got a little bit of jitter um, on these pulses. Now, um, for this sort of thing, a really handy trigger trigger mode is a burst trigger. From different scopes, might actually call it different things. On the Agilent, it's called an nth edge burst. And what this does is you tell it that this is a burst of pulses. You also tell it what, what you consider to be the idle time. And what you can then tell it to do is trigger on a specific pulse within that burst, either 30, you know, the 30th, the 1st, or whatever. So, for example, here we can tell it which is your edge we want to trigger. Let me just get this back into a... Um... So here we're telling it idle time um, about 900 microseconds, which is just basically a time that's bigger than the, um, the, the pulses that that you all need to look at. So we're now telling it to trigger on the first pulse. 
get back to a moving display. So we've now got a nice solid, solid trigger on this first thing, but because we've got this jitter on these, the, the, these other ones, that, that's not very useful for these. But if we now tell it to go on the second one, we're now seeing the second pulse nice and stable, and the third and so on, so we can actually select which of those pulses we want to trigger on. Um, so that means that, say, even if this was a fairly steady waveform, we're not reliant on the stability of everything from there to here. We're just counting these pulses and then getting a really nice trigger so we can actually go, if you want to go right to the end, we can actually go right up to the end of the waveform. And we can zoom in and we've now got a rock steady trigger on that pulse. Um, the other thing this is really useful for is actually counting lines. So for example, um, if you wanted to know how many of these pulses were happening, we can actually use the nth trigger to literally count. So we know that by, by our setting that the, um, our trigger point instantly is over here. Um, so that's triggering on the first edge. As we change that to the second, third, so that's the fourth edge. And we can actually literally move, move through. So the first of this burst was actually edge number four. And if we look at what number the last edge is, and this control was a bit twitchy, so you have to turn it really slowly to um, to make the numbers move slowly. But you can't see we're actually we're actually moving through here, but it's it's a bit hard to actually see it. So here we're getting towards the end, and our last edge is there, which is number 243. So that yeah, that's told us now that we've got 240 pulses. One thing that I actually find annoying, which I've never seen on any scope, what I'd really like to be able to do is get some cursors and like set two cursors up like that and, and get it to tell me how many pulses it can see between those two cursors, but I've never actually found a scope that does that. For this sort of thing, that would be really handy. But say the nth edge burst trigger mode is a way of getting, getting to it, but say it also allows you to get, get this really nice stable trigger on specific parts of the waveform where you've got complex pulse trains and so on so that, that's a, a really handy facility. Effect of triggers you don't often see explained very well this is where it starts getting quite interesting so for example here we see all white scrolling to all black and we, we can see a very clear transition so I mean this tells us quite a few things about the nature of the data we're looking at even without without having any, any sort of particularly complex trigger set up. You know, it tells us that on this trace this is, this is a, uh, a differential signal so we normally expect the two to be an inverse so if we um, it tells us that this is basically the positive signal because when it's white we've got a high and when it's black we've got a low. So that tells us that the information is probably a fairly simple binary coding and it's not scrambled or encrypted or anything stupid like that. I'm just going to take a, a close look at the fine detail. Now from that Agilent document um, it told us that there's actually two signal level, signaling levels going on. We've got a low speed, low power signaling level which is basically um, still normal logic level. So we've got these low speed, low power signaling levels here if we zoom in on here we can actually see there is actually a slight offset um, so just the, the the relative timing of these two conveys some si very simple information um, like sort of this is the start of the um, data and then the actual data is transmitted by these high speed LVDS signals now and the, an LVDS driver is basically a current mode driver it drives the, the receiver tends to have a termination resistor of something like 100 ohms um, and it's driving current through that termination resistance and it's using uh, two lines differentially so that the signal is the difference between the two so the absolute voltage level doesn't matter it's the difference between these two signals that's giving us our, um, our data so this interface it, start, yeah, it switches between a low power mode and an LVDS mode so in this mode uh, when it's not updating the display the LVDS drivers are turned off to save power and if we look at the data in more detail the other thing we can tell if we actually look at that clock signal is that this is actually DDR, double data rate data. You can actually see that we've got transitions of the data on both edges of the clock. Right so now we're going to just take a look, um, analyse this data in a bit more detail and just see if we, you know, what, what we can make, um, what sense we can make out of it. We're using the nth edge trigger so we're triggering on one specific line on the display and you can actually see that by what's happening on, on the display here that we're triggering on a line that's fairly, fairly close to this top edge. And we can see that the data, you know, when it's bright, it's light, um, when it's dark, it's low. So the data looks like it's probably fairly straightforward. One thing to bear in mind is obviously we've, you know, we've generated images of the right resolution, but it's possible it might be going through some additional processing. So we can't necessarily assume that if we give it like a 255 RGB value that it's actually displaying a binary value of 255. There might be some gamma correction and scaling going on, but um, yeah, we've clearly got a very 
a very obvious correspondence between what's happening on the screen and what's happening on the waveforms. And if we, for example, um, look at the, those individual line data, you can actually see this line on the screen, and that's that's obviously the data corresponding to it. Uh, we've got this in zoom mode, so we can sort of zoom zoom right in on. Um, if we just stop that, we can just zoom right in on that and actually see individual bits. Now, obviously, one one of the first problems with any serial system is that you know what you're looking at is a big stream of bits. So to get an understanding of what's going on, you need to figure out things like you know where are the actual boundaries between these that give them meaning as as byte values. And okay, you might sort of make an assumption that. Yeah, perhaps the bit they just start at the first bit, but that that isn't necessarily the case because there might be some run in or there might be some like synchronization sequence. You can see at the beginning of the line we've got this fairly fixed set of data, regardless of the actual um, image data. So we've got some sort of fixed data here. Um, the other thing that we've got, looking at that Agilent document, this is the, what they call the checksum. Now, um, there's various ways of checking data. Um, checksums are the simplest, but they're not really used that often because CRCs give much better error protection. Um, one of the major differences between a checksum and a CRC um, is that with a checksum, if you've got the same data but in a different position, that gives the same checksum, whereas a CRC, it does actually depend on the um, position as well as the actual data content. So basically, a CRC will give a much more random-like result from um, a set of you know, uniform data. So you can quite clearly see that yeah, this looks like it's the yeah the intensity data is ending here because we, we you know we can actually sort of see it, see it see it scrolling in and out. But then we've got this packet sum at the end, and by the fact that it's changing you know almost completely randomly, there's no obvious sort of progression or anything in there, even with like a simple pattern, which is just say the thin line pattern moving across. Um, that strongly suggests that it's a CRC and not a checksum. Um, and obviously CL CLCs are, are harder to reverse engineer than checksums, but as I say, unless they're deliberately obfuscated, there's a relatively small number, particularly the nice this is only a 16-bit CLC, if it's a 32-bit then that like, makes life a lot harder. But with this, this level of, checks of CLCing, it's, it's quite viable to try several of the standard checksums, try them in different bit orders, and it, there's a fairly good chance that you're actually going to um, get somewhere. But say, what, what the other thing we don't actually know is whether this display is even checking this CRC. It could be completely ignoring it, in which case it's, it's just not a problem. And also, it, also, if your target of reverse engineering is, let's say you wanted to take the output of this thing and drive it into a different LCD, you wouldn't really, you know, you could just ignore this because you don't, you know, you don't actually have to check that data. Um, the other issue on the, um, again, from the Agilent information, it said that the uh, initial commands had a, an error correction code in them. So we can see here, this is obviously a fixed a fixed set of data and we have our, our video data starting here. But again, okay, you know, it's got this error correcting code, but because it's a fixed command, it doesn't matter because we don't need to know how it's calculating the error correction code from the data because it's always the same. So we can just look at what, what it's actually putting there and just copy it. So as long as you know, this data isn't changing, um, we don't actually have to worry about calculating an ECC as long as the number of different commands we have to deal with is relatively small then you know, that really isn't a big deal and if we go back and look at the, um, those short packets right at the beginning those are probably going to be different, have different data but again it's fixed, it's always the same data so although this data will probably contain um, both the ECC on the command and the checksum on the content of the packet because it's all constant you know, we can literally just go through manually figuring out what the bit values are and just copy it. So um, that's you know, one thing you quite often don't need to bother about. Whereas, for example, if, if this was maybe some sort of count or a line count or something, then you know, it might be a bit more effort. Right, so we've got this bunch of bits that we can see, but we, you know, what we don't know is how these are, are actually divided into bytes. And also, the other thing we don't know is what the bit order is. We don't know whether it's least significant bit first or um, most significant bit first. Um, now this is why I generated this grayscale pattern because this pattern will in principle have basically a sequence of bytes of increasing value. Now okay because of the may, there may be some correction that yeah, we might not get a complete mapping we can see that as we start from that gray section we're starting off with just a single bit which corresponds to one and if you actually look at this in detail you can actually see that what we actually have here is a binary count. So as we, we can see this left hand bit is flipping fairly slowly. If we move it gradually, increase it up again. So that tells us, firstly, that it's least significant bit first. 
and it's, you can see it counting upwards as, the, as we get to the um, more significant bits. We can just actually try and isolate a single. The, the reason I use green rather than white here, incidentally, is because, again, there might be some colour processing going on. If you did it from black to white, you might find that it was actually giving different values in the RGB fields to do some colour correction and so on. So if you keep to a primary colour, then th that probably gives you a better chance of it being fairly individual, yeah, notable byte values. Um, so what we're expecting, the according to the data sheet, it said it was transmitting 24 bits. So what we're expecting this to be is a 24-bit period between each of these spikes and then each of these being one bit. Now there's, there's a couple of um, ways that can make life a bit easier for doing this. One is uh, most scopes have got a fine time control. So one thing you can do is actually adjust the fine time base until it corresponds to the, um, the grid lines on the display we can probably actually get it to display exactly one bit per, or either one or, two, or maybe two bits per um, division. Now one limitation of that is just the fact that you've only got typically ten divisions, so you quite often might actually want a bit more information than that. But the other thing you can do is if you've got a clock signal like, like we have here, is if we just expand that clock signal, if we just take the grid out of the way, we can actually use our clock signal as, as the grid. So what we can see here, we're expanding now down to the level of one bit. If we use the cursors just to mark where the where we think the first bit is, which is there, and then we use the second cursor. So we've got. Let's assume we've got one byte. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So between these cursors, we've we've got a single byte, and we can actually see that's a very obvious um, binary counting pattern. So we're up here somewhere, so I'll just scroll it up, we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So we've got bit 0, bit 1, bit 2, etc. I'm assuming you can all count in binary in your heads, that's something you just get, get used to doing. Interesting, we're actually get, getting something um, in what I'm assuming is one of the other colour channels. So again, it may well be there's some colour correction going on. As, we, as this green is getting intense, it looks like we're actually getting a little bit in the next colour channel as well. So yeah, it probably is doing some sort of colour adjustment. So you need to be a little bit, little bit wary and not assume that this data is exactly, you know, going unmolested from your original photo to, because it, as well as the display correction, of course, it might be going through JPEG compression or other lossy compression. What this is telling us now, we now know, yeah, we know the byte framing and we know the bit order. So that will allow us to, in principle, figure out the byte value of every single byte within this frame. Okay, it might get a bit tedious, but yeah, it, we can now do that. We know where it all starts. So the, the, the trick here, for example, if you want to figure out how the starting sequence works, we'd go right back to the beginning of literally where, where the display data starts. So that's our first bit of display data there. So what we can now do is actually work back through this packet to figure out where it starts and where the actual bytes are. Um, at this point, it's generally the easiest way is to is just do a screen capture and then go to pen and paper to uh, work out what's going on. I, again, I think it is actually doing some colour mixing because if we you know if we had a screen full of red, we would sort of expect to only see information in the red fields. But I think it, we're actually getting some. It's maybe doing a similar technique to what they use on um, DLP projectors. It's actually mixing some other, almost effectively mixing some white into it just to make the display look uh, brighter than it it actually is. Uh, one other little detail, I think I actually mentioned this in the probing video, is that when you're using the clock like this to actually frame these bits, um, the, there's a good chance that what you're actually going to see is not going to be totally lined up. Um, but again, um, a decent scope will have a, a way of adjusting the skew, which is basically the fine alignment between the channels. So you can use that just to get, get the um, the clock and the data nicely lined up so you can then just effectively you're just using the clock as a, a grid to, as a, a visual aid. Right so here's out the printout of that uh, capture of the start of the packet. Um, so the first thing to do is just write in the binary value. So we know we set our cursor at where we know to be the uh, boundary between the first bit of image data and the first bit of the packet. So if we just go along here and just write the binary values, let's say that having this clock signal here makes it really easy, it is a nice sort of easy grid, so we can just go along, write our binary values. 
if we just put the uh, the bite boundaries in. So yeah, we know that this is a boundary here. And now we know the uh, the bit order is least significant bit first. Um, which is the, what, the one thing that um, can catch you out is the bit order. So you, you're normally when you see binary written down, it's almost always the most significant bit on the left. But because because there's a time plot and we know it's least significant bit first, it's actually backwards. So for example, for this first byte here, um, this is our least significant bit. So when we turn this into hex, yeah, at first glance you'd say, oh, that's one, but no, it's eight because that's the most significant bit and it works downwards. So, uh, but also when we look at a byte value, you know, we need to take it from the whole byte, so we, we just, if we just convert this to hex, we just basically need to turn the whole thing round. So for example, um, that would be B, so we've got B, 8, uh, B, 1, B, 1, 0, 2, 0, 7, 3. And this data was the same on every line, so is there any sense we can make out of this? Well, one thing we do know from that Agilent information is that one of the values in here is a, a word count. So if we assume that we're getting a full line of 240 pixels, um, 240 pixels times three bytes per pixel, because it's RGB, gives us 720. Um, if we convert that into hex, we get 2D0. Now, what we have here, 0 to D1, which is pretty damn close. Um, there's maybe an extra byte thrown in there for some reason or other, but I mean, th yeah, th that that's close enough that that is clearly not a coincidence. So, um, yeah, that's our length. Actually, if we look back at that um, Agile information, we know that that is the ECC. And this is the data ID. So, in fact, that's where that extra byte comes from. We know that our image data starts from here onwards, so we've got 200, um, sorry, 2D, 2D0 hex bytes of image data plus that extra one, and that gives us our 2D1. Um, so, yeah, that the only thing we don't know about is this B8. Now, that again, that may well be some sort of synchronization header or, 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 or something. Again, that's fairly constant. So, I mean, that, that would certainly give us enough to maybe start actually start generating data and throwing data at it out of an FPGA or something. Now it was around this, the, when I got to about this point, this was the point I started, well, you know, I wanted a bit of reassurance and um, that I was on the right track. I mean, th this looks pretty, you know, pretty good going. So I, I did a bit more searching um, and found some more information. Right, now going back to what I was saying earlier about time doing research beforehand is well spent, I sort of only half took that advice. Um, part way through, I decided just to just have another look. And what I tried doing is I just tried searching for just that string. What I was mainly looking for was things like data sheets or other LCDs that had that same interface that might have had a bit more information because it's always worth looking for you know, related objects, say driver chips, whatever. So I just did a search for that and the second thing that came up, courtesy of our friends in China, I found this, a draft version of the actual specification. Confidential members only etc. So um, I could then sort of go through this and actually look at what I'd found so far and just see how this matched up with specification um, just to show that I was on the right track and would we'll probably not have to spend quite as much time reverse engineering stuff but you can probably see that even if I hadn't found this I'd already got pretty close to as much information as I needed. The The main thing that I didn't have was the information on the uh, the CRC at the end of the data lines and uh, CRCs and checksums can be the absolute sort of killer in terms of reverse engineering something in that if what you're talking to has some sort of check over the data and if that data is something you need to vary like say display data then if you can't figure out how that check is calculated then you know you're pretty much screwed. If it's a sort of product where people aren't actively trying to obfuscate it, then there is a good chance it's going to be a fairly standard algorithm. But even with, with something like a 16-bit CRC, yeah, there's quite a few variants. You'd then have to look at either you know, taking lots of sample data and trying to compare that with various CRCs or trying to just generate various CRC types and seeing what's accepted. But one other um, thing I did find reading through this document is that it's not actually mandatory in the standard that the device checks the, CR the CRC value. So it is possible... Um, that you don't actually need to do it. And why, one way of 
there are some ways of um, actually checking that. For example, if you can introduce some deliberate errors, if you you know you've got your test set up, and if you can like inject some sort of glitch in the middle of the data stream, you you could then probably fairly easily see whether that glitch get, gets displayed or whether the device ignores the packet. So if you see a, a yeah you see that glitch on the display, chances are it's not actually checking the checksum, and you can get away without um, actually generating it. Right, so to try and um, produce a deliberate glitch in this data to see what happens, um, I'm using my uh, Regal arbitrary waveform generator, but you could use either any pulse generator or um, even a microcontroller. All, all I'm doing is I'm triggering off this sync edge and just generating a short pulse that I can put in the middle of the data. Obviously you don't want to glitch the beginning of the data because that's got the command header. All we want to do is actually stamp on the actual data and see if that is actually displayed. Data. Um, obviously, we, this jitter is because, they, we, as we saw earlier, the sync is is a bit jittery with respect to the, um, the actual data packets. But it's good enough for what we want to do because there's that nice simple sync pulse. So that's just the easiest thing to trigger trigger the um, generator from. Now, because this is an LVDS signal, the actual data is the difference between the plus and the minus. I'm, I'm only showing one of them here at the moment because we've run out of channels. Now what I was initially trying to do, I'm, I'm feeding the output of the generator through a diode so that it will only at, Put anything on the bus during the uh, the pulse. It doesn't try it sort of bending the bus during the, uh, the the dead dead times. You can see we can actually sort of bend the data, but that's not actually having any effect on it because we've got this termination resistor between the plus and minus on the display. All that's doing is shifting the whole bus. So what we need to do is basically short those pins together. If I just manually short them, you can see it does actually have some effect on the display. But um, so I just short the plus and minus together, the display just sort of freezes and it sort of glitches and so on. But the the, the problem with that, that doesn't really tell us anything because we're we're also sort of losing all the commands and everything. We we want to be sure that we're only actually corrupting the data to see whether um, that checksum's having any effect on it. Well, I didn't get any luck directly injecting the data. The problem is this is quite a low impedance um, circuit, so it's quite hard to actually stamp on the data hard enough. So what I'm doing now, I've just got a MOSFET there, and I'm just basically dragging one line to ground. When I turn the generator on, so if I turn the generator on, we can actually see on the right we are actually getting glitch data, but more importantly, it's not really disturbing the rest of the display. And um, we get an occasional glitch, I think, where the pulse drifts into the header and then the whole display moves up. Um, but that is displaying it, not blanking it, so we get an occasional horizontal jitter. And I think that's where it's just stamping on the packet header, it's slipping one line, it's just missing a complete line because it's not recognising the command and the whole rest of the data shifting up, but um, that's looking very promising. I'm just going to see if I can actually just stamp on a bit more of it, just to get uh, confirmation of that. Well, I've now just set this up in burst mode, so it's generating um, pulses on multiple lines, and again you can see here we've got, and again you can see now it's actually producing quite a lot of data on the screen, but it's yeah, the only time it's glitching the position is where that pulse is drifting into the um, the header because we've got this un slightly unstable sync from the um, V-Sync pulse, but yeah, we clearly have data being sort of s splattered on real displays. Obviously, um, the reason I'm using the clock display is this mode updates continuously, but yeah, we are managing to overlay some data on there, so if it was checking that CRC every time then yeah, we wouldn't be able to do this so I think that gives us a reasonable confidence that it's not actually paying any attention to that CRC at the end of the packet which makes life a lot easier when we're driving it. Uh, another common issue with LCDs in particular is they've almost always got some special sequence to initialise them when they first turn on so as well as yeah, we, we seem to have captured some fairly good good data from the, yeah, the repetitive frame information but we, you also need to just check what happens when it turns on so I've just set this up just to do an edge trigger on a power up on a fairly slow time base and we can see there's a few there's a few sort of odd little things going on there's a few very short commands and again this is a good example where segmented memory is quite a handy way of capturing the data so you can just set up um, some short captures so we can actually just you know, capture all those those individual packets in the same way that we did with the other ones and examine them in detail to see what's going on Right, so if we look at what that's, the, um, the spec says, uh, the DeFi spec says that the, um, there's a synchronisation start sequence which is uh, 0001101. So in fact that's what we see here, we've got the 0001101, so that is our start byte. And if we look at the um, DSi spec, we see that there's a command 39 which just says DCS long right stroke right LUT. 
read through that spec in more detail. DCS stands for Display Command Set, and that's another specification document that actually describes the commands of the LCD controller. And this 3C um, basically says write data starting from the previous address. There's another command 2C, which um, says to write the data from the um, write data at the start address. So. I'm guessing if we actually look back in those frames we'll see that the first frame has a 2C and the subsequent ones have a 3C in it so um, let's just have a look and see if we can confirm that. Right so this is triggering on the um, showing the second line we will just framed up the, uh, the byte here and so I've triggered on that that first byte of the packet off the ECC so we've got 00111100 which is 3C. If I, now, if I now change the trigger to trigger on the line before it which is, we can now see that's changed to 2C so we've got that 2C command for yeah, start of frame and then 3C to write data at subsequent um, addresses. And of course that's an example of the subtle little detail that you, know, you can spend ages on um, if you just didn't happen to notice that it was sending you know, a different command on that first line than all the others you know, you could spend quite a lot of head scratching trying to figure out what the hell is going on when your uh, your hardware is not working. So um, the other thing I found when I was searching, I found a slightly more detailed version of the LCD data sheet, and this included a page of initialization sequences. Um, so if we look at those, we can actually see that those also correspond with um, the initialization data that I captured from this. And these are the um, capture data at the startup. We've got 0511C corresponds to this entry in the LCD data sheet and then we have the second one 153608 which again corresponds to the um, data we've got on the LCD data sheet. So we've, we've pretty much got everything there. Right so that's that's basically most of the reverse engineering done. Um, I will write this up at some point but I'm going to wait until I've actually got manage to drive this thing separately um, before I do that just to make sure everything's correct so please don't message me asking me if you can drive this off an Arduino no you can't it needs to be the data rate is too high the um, amount of data is too much and what might be interesting to see is how slowly you can clock this and have it still work because it's it's conceivable you might just be able to convince something like um, a quad SPI port on a, an ARM micro to generate um, data fast enough to do it but um, it may or may not be feasible. There, there probably are some timeouts built into this thing, so I'm not sure. But I'm going to sort of knock up something with an FPGA to generate timings that match this as close as possible to actually get the thing working. And then at some point, maybe look to see if it can be slowed down at all. But um, yeah, at the very, you know, it, it's pretty much going to be an FPGA solution. You might be able to do something with a high-end arm, or maybe something with a, um, a, a fast processor with a, a maybe a, a CPLD or something, just to do the high-speed serialization. Um, but the, yeah, this is not a, you know, not not a, an old Nokia monochrome display. This is this needs quite a lot of um, data rate to talk to it. Um, although it does appear it has got built-in memory. Obviously, it's one way you can only write to it. So you couldn't do, for example, a line draw in its own buffer because you wouldn't be able to do a read modify write. But um, it might be feasible to just send it commands to just plot certain objects on the screen. But you may well, for example, you might be limited to only writing whole lines in one go. So I think, you know, the prospects for driving this seriously with something that doesn't have enough memory for a full frame buffer um, are going to be sort of fairly minimal. And this is a fairly sort of high res display, as small displays go, you, you know, you'd need a, um, a frame buffer of about 168k for a full frame. Um, so you're looking at a sort of fairly high-end system. Um, you could probably do pixel doubling or go monochrome or something to drive it from something a bit smaller. But if you want to do like proper shape plotting and so on, where you need the full frame buffer, you do actually need quite a lot of RAM. So it's yeah, way out of the scope of you know, the, the low-end the low stuff. And obviously the other issues, you need to generate the LVDS signals. You've got 1.8 volt signaling and the LVDS. So it should be relatively straightforward to drive it from an FPGA, um, but not from a microcontroller. And even with an FPGA, you're going to need some external memory, quite a big FPGA, FPGA to get that much memory on board, so you're probably looking at an FPGA with some external memory. I hope the reverse engineering aspects were interesting, because a lot of those techniques are very applicable to all sorts of things, not just displays, um, and also just hope it just gave an insight into you know, the advantages of having a scope that's got some more advanced triggering facilities, because it, for things like this it does actually really speed things up, it just gives you much more insight into what's going on, it makes, you, makes it much easier to sort of gra grab the information you're looking for, 
so you can actually start decoding. So obviously if you're actually wanting to decode things down to the, the level of you know what actual bike commands are fly, flying around the place, you need a nice sort of stable signal that you can just look at, look at and analyze. Um, obviously, obviously a more complicated protocols, you might need to start actually building bits of custom hardware to actually grab the data and dump it out into something if there's like a lot of data. But uh, so I hope that was interesting.